Well, I want to welcome you again here to Life Church. And if you happen to be new with us, I want you to know that um, we want to give you a special welcome. But also, if you want to connect with us, the best way to do that is to open up your bulletin you should have received when you came in. And there's a little connect form there. You can fill that out and then drop it in one of the four different boxes, collection boxes. Later in the service, there's a time at the end uh, that everybody will have a chance to get up and move around. And so that would be a time to do that. Also, I want you to be aware that those boxes, they're offering boxes, but that means that you're not supposed to give, to be honest. Uh, If you're a guest with us, if you're visiting with us, we just want you to enjoy this time together with us and God. And, uh, And so don't worry about any of that stuff. Just come, enjoy yourself. Uh, and be a part of what God's doing here. Um, Now, I want to just quickly let us know that we're entering into a brand new sermon series today, and uh, I just got back from Mexico um, yesterday, late yesterday afternoon. Um, We have about 30 or 35, I'm I'm not sure what the number is, over 30 people down there right now that are doing a a one-mission build, so we're building a house. Uh, It takes three days. It's awesome. Um, And then we also have some of our uh, doctors and nurses that are down there doing a clinic. And then we've also had some people that are working with kids and doing a a community lunch and those kind of things. And so there's a lot that's going on down there right now. And so I want to, before we get into the message, I want to have prayer on two levels. I want to pray for the team that's still down there doing God's work among those people, living like Jesus, loving like Jesus, and sharing his message down there. And then I also want to pray for us as we enter into this new series. It's called Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. And today we're actually going to be looking at why grace is so amazing. Why grace is so amazing. So as we get ready to do that, let's go ahead and have a moment of prayer. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you so much for all those that are down in Mexico right now. uh, Because they represent you. And Lord, they represent us too. But they represent you. And it's a beautiful thing to see that interaction with so many people that we've never encountered before, but we have the opportunity to love on and to, to live your life before and to be able to share, share you with. Thank you so much for that gift. Lord, continue to empower them, protect them, and use them for your glory. And then, Lord, right now, as we enter into this message time, we pray that you would move through us. I pray that you would move through me. Um, going down to Mexico really messed, messed me up. It did. Uh, on my pattern, my rhythm, Lord, I'm a, I'm a person of habit, and so, Lord, clear my mind and clear my heart so that you would speak clearly through me. And then, Lord, I ask for each one of us that we would have minds to conceive and hearts to receive and hands to, to be used for your glory on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. If you were to actually survey Christians all across the world and ask them what their favorite hymn was, um, I truly do believe that hands down, it would be amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wrench like me. If you were to do a survey of the various churches all across the world that had grace in its name, like Grace Community Church, or Grace Baptist Church, or Grace Methodist Church, or, or Grace Brethren, or Grace Bible Church, etc., etc., I truly do believe that would be the leading name of all the churches around the world. For a, number, for a number of years, a number of years, he's now passed, but one of the top business writers and communicators in America was a guy by the name of Peter Drucker, and many of you who have been in the business world know who he is. Peter was once asked why a person like him, this outstanding individual, extremely intelligent and gifted, why a person like him would become a Christian. He said, well, I studied all the religions of the world, and when I studied Christianity, it had this thing called grace. Grace. And being a business person who recognizes a good deal when I come across it, I grabbed it because grace is the best deal to ever come along. What is grace? I'm going to invite you to do something awkward and turn to the person beside you and tell them what grace is. Ten seconds. Right now. Boom. Ten seconds. What is grace? What is grace? All right. Some of you responded, some of you didn't, that's okay. <laughs> but the kind of grace we're talking about today is not a blue-eyed blonde. 
um, though, though, there's, though there's some beautiful blue-eyed blondes that are called grace. But the kind of grace that we're going to talk about today is sometimes defined as unmerited or undeserved favor. Unmerited or undeserved favor. Now, to be really honest with you, that's not very personal, is it? And uh, it almost, to be honest, makes me yawn. I think unmerited, unearned favor? Come on! I mean, what's the big deal? And so here's my goal today. This is truly my goal. My goal is to have every single one of us here so moved by grace that when we hear the word grace by the end of this sermon, we'll say, wow. Wow. What an amazing thing grace truly is. And so that's my goal. And to get us along that path, that wow phase, to get us down there, here we go. Now, I need to set a little context for us. If we're really going to understand what grace is and the wow factor of grace, we can't understand that wow factor unless we understand within the context of at least two other words, and that's justice and mercy. And so first, let's look at the word justice. A simple, a very simple, one, kind of one-sentence definition of justice is this. Justice is getting precisely what you deserve. That's justice. It's getting precisely what you or I deserve. For example, if you got caught speeding 30 miles over the speed limit, and uh, not a one of us has ever done that, right? You're, you go into the judge, and the judge finds you $300, right? Now, he's not being mean or nasty when he finds you $300. No, he's, what is he doing? He's simply having you pay what you're supposed to pay, right? In other words, he's simply being just. Or if you walk into your neighbor's house, and you steal your neighbor's TV, and you go before the judge, and that judge says, you know what, that's going to be two years. Two years in jail for that. Again, that judge is not working out some personal vendetta against you. No, he is simply going to give you what you deserve, precisely what you deserve. That's called justice, when you get what you deserve. The Bible says in Psalm 916 that the Lord is known by his justice, by his justice. And then throughout the scripture, the Bible teaches that God is just in all his ways. He is just in all his ways. And so our God is a just God. And he's going to make sure that people get exactly what they deserve. This January, uh, some of us are going to have the opportunity to go to, to Israel together with some of the others in Life Church here. And I promise you, one of the most moving and one of the most disturbing places that we will go when we're in Israel is the Holocaust Museum. And friends, when you enter into that museum and you begin to see the horrors of the Holocaust the concentration camps, the gassing, the, fine, the furnaces, the, the firing squads, the lampshades that were actually made out of Jewish skin. When you see these unbelievable atrocities, there is something inside of you that stirs. And you want to make sure. You want to make sure that the people who committed those kind of unbelievable atrocities are going to get what they deserve. I mean, friends, when you kill six million people, Somebody better get what they deserve. And when somebody goes into a hospital and they steal a baby and they kill it. You know, friends, we live in a messed up world, don't we? A messed up world. And when somebody does something like that, doesn't it make you glad that you know someday there's going to be justice? There's going to be justice. The Bible says that there's going to be justice for everybody. Because God is just in all his ways. But here's another truth that's true about you and me. We human beings are often a, a little ambivalent about justice, aren't we? I mean, the truth is you and I are all for justice when other people are messing with us, when they're taking advantage of us, when they're wronging us. We want his justice, and we want it now. But let's be honest. What happens when we're the one who wrongs somebody else? What happens when we mess up, when we take advantage of somebody else? What happens then? I'll tell you what happens. You and I often look for a little flexibility, don't we? Yes, we do. Friends, in order to understand grace, you've got to understand justice, and justice is getting precisely what you and I deserve. No more and no less. Now, let's look at mercy. What's mercy? 
Well, mercy is not getting what you deserve. That's what mercy is. It's not getting what you deserve. In other words, if you get caught doing that 30 miles above the speed limit, justice says you ought to pay 300 bucks for that. But let's just say you go through before a kind-hearted judge. There are some of those in the world, aren't there? There's a former judge right here in the front row. There are some, right? Okay. Did you ever do anything like this? Look at somebody and discern their spirit and say, you know what, I'm not going to give you justice. I'm going to make it, rather than 300, I'm going to make it 150. That's what I'm going to have you pay. And so you give them a little break, right? You have them pay just not everything they deserve. Did you ever do that? It's a rare thing. That's out of the mouth of a judge right there. His name is Gene. Fortunately, he didn't serve here. Um, <laughs> now, if you broke into your neighbor's house and you had stole their TV, justice says you deserve to have served two years in jail. But what if that judge looks at you, he looks at your case, and he says, you know, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be merciful to you. I'm only going to give you 12 months, one year instead of two years. I'm not going to give you everything you deserve. Psalm 103.8 says that our Lord is merciful. Hear this. He is merciful, compassion, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. Two verses later, it says in verse 10, that our God does not treat us as our sin deserves or repay us according to our iniquities. You know what that means? That means that our God is the, ru the ruler of the universe, does not, throughout the day, look at you and me and give us one-to-one -one retribution for the things that we've done. In other words, he doesn't give us a whack every time we do something wrong. I mean, could you imagine what that would be like? It would be some long, hard days, wouldn't it? Some long, hard days if every time we made a mistake, every single moment of every single day, he, he gave us one-to-one -one retribution. It would be a long, hard day for many of us in this room. But the Bible says that God instead is merciful. He does not give us one-to-one -one retribution. He doesn't give us what we deserve. That's mercy. When you and I don't get what we deserve. But grace, grace is actually in a category all by itself. Grace is receiving wonderful, magnificent, beyond anything you and I can imagine, and certainly anything that we could ever deserve, favor. Grace is in a whole different category. It's getting what we do not deserve. It's getting what we do not deserve. Let's say that this past summer, while you were hiding from the heat, um, that you got into this magazine, and, and when you opened this magazine, you saw this mother of all birdhouses. And, uh, I mean, it's really like the Hilton of all birdhouses that have regular rooms and, and junior suites and regular suites and master suites and decks and water systems and food systems. I mean, this is the birdhouse to kill all birdhouses. And so you can't wait. You get this, you get it in the mail, and you can't wait to hear your birds start chirping and singing in their, their new little house. And so you put up this incredible birdhouse on a post right outside of your be bedroom window. And one Saturday morning, you get up, and you hear the chirping, you hear the singing of these birds, and it's phenomenal. It's heaven to your ears. And so you hear this beautiful music, and you decide, you know what, I'm just going to take it really easy today. I'm going to go down to the kitchen, get a cup of coffee, I'm going to get Benji, my dog, and take him out for a little walk, and then I'm going to come on back in, and I'm going to just sit down in front of the window, and I'm just going to listen to those birds sing as, as I read a book. Friends, it doesn't get any better than that, Right? And so you go get your coffee and you head outside with Benji. No sooner do you get outside than you see little 12-year-old Jimmy, the dentist a menace of your, of your little neighborhood, and he has a rock in his hand. And you see him eyeing your birdhouse. And as soon as you see him, you know exactly, I mean, you know exactly what that kid's thinking. You know it, right? Because you've been there. You know it. But before you can stop him, little Jimmy launches that rock. Well, fortunately, little Jimmy doesn't throw very well. And so he misses your birdhouse, but he obliterates. He obliterates your master bedroom window. And so you quickly run over to him, and, and you, you don't want to grab him, but you don't grab him. You just run over to him and say, Jimmy, 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 what are you doing, Jimmy? Jimmy, what, are you, what am I going to do with you? Well, the truth is, you have at least three options with that boy, don't you? You can either treat Jimmy with justice with mercy, or with grace. Justice would say, Jimmy, what you did was stupid, and it was wrong. 
very wrong. And so I'm going to call the police. I'm going to press formal charges against you, destruction of personal property. And while the police are on their way, I'm going to call your parents. And I'm going to ask them to come over here, and I'm going to ask them to write a check out to replace that window, and then I'm going to send you home with them. Now, let me be honest. Would that be mean or nasty or awful if you actually simply gave Jimmy what he deserved? Would you be mean or nasty or awful? No. You only give him what he deserves. You're simply being just. He committed a crime. His parents need to know. Payment needs to be made. And so the truth is, Jimmy shouldn't, now he might, but he shouldn't carry a grudge against you since you are simply being just. And you do have that option, all right? Or maybe something actually starts to stir in your spirit and, and you say to yourself, you know what, I'm not going to give Jimmy everything he deserves. Instead, I'm going to give him a little bit of mercy. And so you look at little Jimmy, you look him square in the eye, and you say, you know what, Jimmy, what you did was both stupid and wrong. It was a crime. It was a crime. But I'm not going to call the police on you, no. I'm not going to call the street police. Instead, I'm going to demonstrate a little mercy to you. And so I'm going to call your parents, and I'm going to ask them to come down here. I'm going to tell them what you did, and I'm going to ask them to pay for the window, and then I'm going to ask them to take you home. Now, how would Jimmy probably respond to that point? Maybe, maybe, if he knows really what's going on here, thanks. I mean, thanks for not calling the police, and thanks for not giving me everything I deserve. Now, what would grace look like? What would grace look like? It might look like this. Putting your hand on little Jimmy's shoulder and squeezing. No. <laughs> put, put your hand on little Jimmy's shoulder and say, you know what, Jimmy? What you did is pretty stupid, buddy, and it was wrong. I could call the police, but I'm not going to. I'm not even going to call your parents. Here's what I want to do. Why don't we jump in my car and let's go down to Ace Hardware. Let's buy some gla gas or glass together and, I, and I'll pay for it. I'll pay for it. And then I want to come back here with you and I want to teach you how to install a window. We'll do that together. And so that's what you do. You, you go down to Ace Hardware, you, you, Ace Hardware, you get the glass, you, you put it in yourself, you, you do it with him and, and you teach Jimmy how to install that window. After it's all caulked and all that kind of stuff, you turn to Jimmy and you say, hey Jimmy, why don't we head out and get a hamburger or something? I mean, I'd really like to find out what you're thinking about for your future. You know, like never doing a window again. And <laughs> or, you know, I, I just really would like to, to find out more about you, if you don't mind. Let, let's go do go, go, go hamburger. And if, if you want on the way home, we'll just stop by Cold Stone, pick up some ice cream. I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, Derek, that's dumb. <laughs> I mean, think about it. If you treat a kid like that, what's he going to do? He's going to go out and start throwing rocks through everybody's window, right? And you know, almost every time, almost every time grace is demonstrated, somebody thinks it's dumb. They do. Somebody thinks you've gone too far. Somebody says, you know what? You're going to let that person off the hook too easy. Somebody thinks you're going to be taken advantage of. Somebody says, you know what? Grace is a risky business. And friends, the truth is this, grace is a risky business. It is. The truth is, Jimmy is going to respond in one, one of two ways. He's either going to be profoundly moved by it, or he's going to take advantage of it. That's what's going to happen. One of the most memorable stories in the entire Bible, at least for me, is Luke 15, the parable of the prodigal son, the wayward son. Most of us remember it. The prodigal son goes to his father and he says, Dad, you know, I love you, man. I love you. But come on, Dad, when are you going to die? I need my money. That's the truth. If you're asking for an inheritance in that day, the only way you get it, just like today, is if you die. And so, come on, Dad, when are you going to die? I need my money. I need my money. And for reasons I truly don't completely understand, the father says, okay. And he gives his kid this money. And then the Bible says this young guy takes off with his inheritance. He goes to a distant land. And one translation says that he lived wildly, blowing all of his money. The other, another translation says he squandered it all on riotous living. The bottom line is, this guy spent it on wine, women, and song. And we all know he didn't sing much, right? It's the truth. And of course... <laughs> What he did instead is he took this money, he threw some parties, right? He threw some parties. Well, things go from bad to worse, and there's an economic downturn that takes place there. There's a famine in the land. 
And he ends up in a place where he has no money left. His friends, or so-called friends, have all left him because he can't throw a party anymore. Nobody's going to give this guy a job except for feeding pigs. This guy actually gets to the point, we know the story, he gets so hungry that he longs to eat the slop that he's feeding the pigs. But then in the middle of all this, Jesus says in Luke chapter 15, verse 17, he says that that young man came to his senses. It was one of those aha moments. He came to his senses. And he realizes two things. He realizes, first, what he has done, and he, too, realizes what he deserves. He comes to his senses, he realizes what he has done, and he realizes what, what he deserves. In other words, he's begun to sort out the justice that he deserves in this situation. And this is what he concluded he deserved. He concluded that his behavior made him unworthy to be called his father's son anymore. He says, I'm not worthy. I've screwed up. I've screwed up big time. And I deserve to be shunned. I deserve to be shunned from my father, shunned from my family for the rest of my life. I have sinned against heaven and against earth. And so there is no question in his mind what he deserves. Justice says, I deserve to be separated from my family for the rest of my life. Friends, don't miss this. This is a very, very important element here. This young guy understands. He understands what he deserves. But then, as he's coming to his senses, he also has this little ray of hope. And he says, you know, Justice says, I'm not worthy to be my father's son anymore. But maybe, maybe, just maybe if I go home, maybe, just maybe if I own up to what I've done, maybe, just maybe if I admit what I deserve, then maybe my dad will give me a little bit of mercy. And maybe, just maybe, I can become one of his hired hands and I can live in the bunkhouse and at least then I'll have a roof over my head and food in my belly. And so he heads home, knowing that he deserves justice, but hoping beyond hope that he might get just a little bit of mercy, just a little bit of mercy. Do you remember what this prodigal son does when he first gets home? The very first thing he does, the very first thing he does when he sees his dad is he cries out and he says, I know what I deserve. I have sinned against you and I've sinned against heaven. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But what does that father do? What does that father do? Before that son can actually finish his words, he spills out grace after grace after grace after grace all over his boy. Now, friends, don't miss this. This father knows what his boy deserves. He knows that that boy doesn't deserve a thing. He knows that he has squandered everything he's given him. He's thrown it all away. He's blown it on righteous living, or, or riotous living. And so the bunkhouse, he knows the bunkhouse is too good for this kid. As a matter of fact, he knows that the Pharisees, who Jesus is telling this story to, would have stoned that kid. They would have stoned him for the shame that he brought to his father and family. Friends, that's justice. That's what that kid deserved in that culture. But Jesus says, when this father sees his son in a distance, evidently he had been looking down the road every day for his son's return. It says he was moved and he felt compassion and he raced to him and he threw his arms around him and he gave him a great big hug and a great big kiss. Why did he do all that? Because everybody in that town was waiting to stone his boy and he was going to protect him. And after he'd protected him, he turned to one of his servants and he said, go, go and get my best robe, my very best robe, my robe of honor and put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and go and kill the fatted calf and let's have a party to end all parties. And friends, when this wayward son came home, he came home knowing knowing what he deserved, justice, justice. But he was hoping when he came home, he might get just a little bit of mercy, just a little bit of mercy. But when he got home, when he got home, his dad gave him grace upon grace upon grace, and it blew his mind. It blew his mind, because that is what grace does. 
I mean, friends, think about this. It blew his older brother's mind too, didn't it? Because when he heard what was going on, he went ballistic. He returned from the field and he said, well, well, wait a minute, what are you doing here? This kid didn't just screw up. He blew it up. This kid blew everything up. And now you're throwing him a party? What are you doing? I mean, I can understand maybe, just maybe a little corner in the bunkhouse someplace, maybe. But what is this, a party to end all parties? It's scandalous. Absolutely scandalous. And it was, friends. It was absolutely scandalous because it was called grace in a society that was built on justice. It was called grace, and grace is scandalous. Now, let me ask you something. Would this story of the prodigal son, would it have turned out any differently, would it have turned out any differently if that son had not owned up to what he deserved? Would it end up any differently? I mean, suppose this kid actually comes waltzing into his dad's house, he says, Mom and Dad, hey, I'm home. Where's the party? Where's the band? Oh, man, I'm so tired of living like a pig. It's time for me to live large. It's time for me to live the good life. And so he goes marching into his mom and dad's bedroom. He plops down on their bed, and he says, oh, yeah, by the way, before you leave, give me a drink, and don't forget to leave the, the remote. Friends, if that kid would have come home with that kind of attitude, I'd have kicked his butt. But if he would have come home with that kind of attitude, he would have never come clean. Think about this. If he'd never come clean about what he deserved, how do you think this story would have turned out? Would it have turned out a little differently? Absolutely it would have. Absolutely. Now I'm going to take the gloves off here and we're going to get right down to it. Do you know what you and I, hear this, do you know what you and I deserve do you know what you and I deserve? Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. And Romans 3.23 says that we have all sinned and fallen glory, short of the glory of God. Do you know what you and I deserve? Other passages tell us that Every time you and I commit a sin, every time we rebel against God and go our way and God, not God's, every time we do that, you and I deserve immediate retribution, chastisement, discipline from God every time. That's what we deserve, one-to-one -one correspondence. I mean, friends, every time you break into a neighbor's house and you steal a TV, you're going to get in trouble. Justice is going to come your way. The scripture tells us that each and every time we sin against God, justice says you and I deserve immediate one-to-one -one retribution for every sin we commit and that we deserve to be separated from him for all of life and all of eternity. And friends, if God did that, hear this, if God did that, he would not be mean and he would not be nasty. He would simply be being just. Being just. Let's go through just a couple of the Ten Commandments. Commandment number one, put God first in your life. It says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Put God first in your life. Let me ask you something. Have you always and in every situation, in every, situ in every decision, in every crossroad of your life, at every hour of every day, throughout your whole life, have you always put God first? If you're like me, you have to say no. Now, if you jump down to commandment number five, honor your father and your mother. Have you honored your father and mother perfectly in every situation, in every moment, every single day of your life, all life long, have you? And how about this one? Thou shalt not steal. You know what would be really cool right now? Is all of a sudden, if every single thing you and I have ever stolen, everything we've ever stolen, like every pencil we ever borrowed or and didn't return, or every tool that we never returned, every single thing that we illegally downloaded, if all of that would just suddenly materialize on our lap in a great big pile right now, I wonder what that would look like in this room. All right? How about this one? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Anybody here in thought, in deed, done sexual sin? Thought or deed? Ever. Any kind of sexual sin. Now, how many of you 
have violated at least one of those four of ten commandments. At least one. Now, I don't want to get technical here, but do you know what you deserve? Do you know what you and I deserve? You and I deserve immediate retribution for each and every violation of the will and the way of God, which means we deserve death, separation from God in this life and in the next. But friends, hear this. As clear as the Bible is on this, and as clear as I'm trying to make it right now, I'm telling you that there are scores of people, scores of people who will look you right in the eye and they'll say, I'm a good guy or I'm a good gal. And yeah, I messed up here and yeah, I've done some stuff wrong over there, but I'm a good guy, I'm a good gal, and so God owes me. God owes me. Or they'll say to us something like, you know what, what about, what about my Aunt Ethel? I mean, Aunt Ethel was the nicest person in the world. I mean, she was kind, she was loving, she was generous, she was a great lady. And so Derek, are you trying to tell me that because Aunt Ethel never got into God, because she never became one of those born-again types and all that kind of stuff. Are you trying to tell me that when she died, God took her and he just hurled her into hell? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Friends, I want to be honest. A question like that is a really difficult question to respond to, and I can't hit every single response that I need to, but let me just give you this. First of all, let's just lay a basis here and just say Aunt Ethel really was a truly wonderful person. A mother, Teresa, rest in peace. God bless her soul. Get out of the way. She was a wonderful person. Now, of course, we all know she wasn't perfect. I mean, just ask Uncle Frank. Uncle Frank remembers a few times where Aunt Ethel didn't quite make it up to par. But let's just say that she actually was an extraordinary person. Well, no matter how good or how nice she was, at some point we have to ask the question, how did she treat God? Yeah, she was nice to people, but how did she treat God? The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that God leaves clues, clues about his identity and about his power all over his created realm, all over it. But Anne Ethel, she could stand on the south rim of the Grand Canyon and say, nope, I don't think so. I don't think there's any kind of intelligent design there. I don't think there's any kind of all-powerful supreme being who put all this stuff together. No, I don't think so. She could stand, stand at the edge of the Niagara Falls. Have you been there? Beautiful, magnificent, and say, no, nope, no, nope, mm, I don't think so. She could watch the sunset on a beautiful ocean bay and say, no, I don't think so. You know, in Romans chapter 1, it says, when somebody refuses to acknowledge the clues of the Creator, they exchange the truth for a lie. They lie to themselves, and they lie to God. Beyond that, Jesus says in John 16, that all throughout the course of our lives, because God loves us, he is constantly working through His Spirit to draw us, to tap us on the shoulder, to tug on our hearts, to woo us to Himself, saying, here I am. I love you. you. You know that, and I want to get to know you better. Don't you want to get to know me? And Jesus says the Spirit of God is constantly reaching out to us. Some theologians call that provenient grace, God's provenient grace, where God is reaching out to us even before we know he exists. But you know what Anne Ethel did? Hundreds of thousands of times through her life, every time the Spirit said, I love you, Every time the Spirit said, I'm reaching out for you, and I'm trying to connect to you, I want to show you something deeper every time. She showed no interest. And every time God reached out to her, he slapped, she slapped God's hand away, and she said, God, I, don't put that hand in my face. I don't want you. I don't need you. I'm not going to acknowledge you. Keep your hand out of my face. Sometime in Anne Ethel's life, she probably actually saw a picture of the crucified Christ. And think about this. You know what she did. I see it. But who cares? To her dying bare breath, she fended God off, pushing him away, saying, I don't want you. I don't need you. 
I don't acknowledge you. Now here's the question. Would God be unjust? Would God be unjust if after Aunt Ethel treated him that way for more than 80 years, insisting on her independence, insisting on her distance, insisting on her separation from him her whole life long? Would God be unjust to say, all right, Aunt Ethel, if that's the way you want it, then that's the way it's going to be for you for all eternity. I'm going to give you exactly what you want. I mean, I did everything in my power to open your heart to me. I gave you mercy and I gave you grace. I sent Christ to die for you. I did every single thing within my power to redeem your life and prove my love. But you fended me off for 80 years. And then you died. Friends, let me ask you, would God be unjust? Would he be unjust? If he allowed Anne Ethel to have that kind of eternity, an eternity that she insisted on all of her life, an eternity separated from him? I don't think so. I don't think so. You see, friends, the problem is not with God. It's with Anne Ethel. She was never willing to acknowledge what she deserved. She never responded to mercy. She never affirmed her need for grace. I know a guy a number of years ago, he died, and at his funeral, he had three sons. Awesome young men. Awesome young men. And when they stood up, they didn't deify their dad, but they did honor him. And they thanked God for the great impact that he had had on their lives. When they were done, the pastor stood up. I wasn't me. It wasn't me. I was at another funeral. And he shared that for 40 years, this man that had died had been a milkman. For 40 years, he had gotten up every day at 4 o'clock in the morning, every day, six days a week, to deliver milk. And before he died, this pastor had asked him why he did that. And you know what that man said? He said, so my three boys wouldn't have to. I did it to provide them with an education and some opportunities that I didn't get. I did it so they wouldn't have to. You know, my friends, someday every single person in this room, every single person in this world is going to stand before Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, face to face. And when we see him on that judgment day, the Bible says he, has still, he still has nail-scarred hands. He has nail-scarred feet. He has a wound still in his side. And when we see him in that moment, we're going to look at Jesus in all his heavenly glory and we're going to see those scars and we're going to be dumbfounded and we're going to say something like, why? Why? You're God's one and only son. Why did you come to earth? Why did you take all the ridicule and scorn and abuse? Why did you let him pluck your beard and whip your back and pummel your face, put a crown of thorns on your head? Why? Why did you let him slap you across the back with that cross and then drive you up that hill? Why did you just lay there and let him put spikes through your hands and feet? Why did you allow yourself to be hung on a tree and die an excruciating death? Why? Why did you do that? And you know what Jesus is going to say? So that you wouldn't have to. So that you wouldn't have to. Friends, the wages of sin is death. But he says, I paid the wage. I paid the price so that he wouldn't have to. That's grace. That's grace. And friends, that is scandalous. It is wonderful. It is life-transforming grace. Grace. But hear this. Nobody... Nobody understands, nobody accesses, nobody is transformed by grace unless they first start by saying, I know what I deserve. I know what I deserve. So the question is, do you know what you deserve? Friends, this is an important day because there is a lot at stake right here, right now, in this very moment. There are some of you who are ready right now. You say, you know what? I know what I deserve. I know what I deserve. 
But I also know what he's extended to me. What he's extended to me. He's extended to me this unbelievable thing called grace when he died on the cross for me. And so, I won't have to do that. Instead, I know that by his grace, my sins are covered. They're washed clean. And I can be made whole. Because he wants me to be a part of his family. He wants me to experience what it's like to be adopted into his family and experience the power to live and to love and to share him wherever I go. Now, as we close, I want to, and we bow our heads together, if this is your day, if you're ready to say, you know what, I know what I deserve. I know I need your grace. I know I need what Jesus did for me on the cross, and right now I'm ready to accept that payment for my sins. If that's where you're at, then before you go home today, hear this, before you go home today, share that with somebody. Share it with somebody. Share it with me. Share it with Shannon. Share it with your Bible study leader. Share it with a prayer ministry team member that's going to be up front. Share it with a loved one. Share it with a spouse, but share it with somebody. Also, we've got some materials for you if you're making that step today. We've got some New Believer Bibles back here at the Connect table. Please pick one of those up. I'm going to have the journey. It's a booklet. It's, it's a booklet of six weeks of, of studies for those who come to faith. And there's also a Connecting with God brochure back there. Those are some things in this critical time that you can begin to use to build up your faith and to begin to walk with Him more faithfully. Also, before we go into prayer, I truly know that right now there are some who have already received God's grace in your life, haven't you? But the truth is, there's been no power. There's been no power to be grace-filled vehicles to extend God's grace to others. And so you need to begin to pray, to ask God's Spirit to come. He's already in you, but to fill you with His power. Because, hear this, the message and the grace that you have received is not meant to be kept by you. It is meant to be shared. To be shared with the whole world. Now let's pray. God, I thank you so much for what you're doing in this room among us right now. I thank you for every person here who's been bold enough to admit to themselves what they deserve and who has been humble enough to say, I know that you have the answer to what I need, grace, that your death on the cross offers me forgiveness and wholeness. And that as you adopt me into your family, as I open my heart, you give me your Holy Spirit to fill me and to empower me to share your love and to be your witness with others. God, thank you for those people that are making those decisions right now. And thank you, Lord, for this amazing thing, this amazing thing called grace. And all God's people said, Amen.